This is Clearly Christian with Dr. Cy Smith, bringing light and giving voice to our country's single greatest hope while moving the culture to God's design. Our mission, to increase the census of those who live and influence society from a biblical worldview. The time for Clearly Christian is now. Here is your host, Dr. Cy Smith. I'm Dr. Cy Smith, and this is Clearly Christian, a podcast about what it means to see the world from God's perspective, and then the impact that this has on training the next generation to live a life according to or consistent with a biblical worldview. If you've been listening to the show for a while and you like what you hear, I'd appreciate if you hit the subscribe button or follow along, leave a review if you can. That'll let others know that the show is worth listening to, it's worth checking out, and it will uh, definitely help us support our cause and advance our mission here to make a difference with Christian education. Our guest today is Mr. Troy McIntosh. He's the executive director of OSIN, which stands for the Ohio Christian Education Network. OSIN is a coalition of schools and community members that advocates for religious liberty and education freedom in Ohio, specifically by advocating at the State House uh, there in Columbus. Today, we're going to talk about our local schools, schools where 90% of the country sends their children, including Christians. We're going to talk about what's going on in those schools, what's going wrong in those schools, why it's going wrong, and what can be done at the state level in order to fix those situations. But first, let's go to school and let's set up our program. Today, I need you to know more about what's going on in our local schools based on their connection to our national education system and the consequences that that has for Christian families and their children. You know, Christian families send their children to public schools, government schools, free schools, common schools, whatever you want to call them, for many different reasons. Many will say that there's a number of Christians who work there and teach there, so they feel relatively safe there and feel that their kids will be uh, relatively secure from harmful influences or negative ideas. And if some of those unsafe, unsafe ideas do happen to seep through, then they'll believe they can fix some of those problems at home uh, where they can talk those things through with the kids. Still others believe as long as my child gets the basics, they learn to read and write and to do math, then they can instill some of the rest of those important values at home as well, perhaps around the dinner table. But that's not how the education system in America works. The federal and state governments determine what will be taught and how it will be taught, even at the local levels. The views of the majority or those with power or influence or money will determine what education looks like in this country. Christian teachers in these schools can't go rogue and just decide to present the biblical worldview as truth. They would lose their job for that. Yes, schools are teaching kids how to read, but they're also teaching them what to read and how to interpret what we read. Everything we teach is designed to influence behavior, and whatever group has the most power or the most influence will determine what that behavior looks like or how it's directed. Contrary to what's often said and what you often hear, educators are teaching your child not just how to think, but what to think. They are teaching a worldview whether they realize it or not, and most students will carry that with them the rest of their lives. This is not done by accident. This is how the system is designed to work, and it's worked that way for over 100 years now. So we're going to talk about this today with Troy McIntosh shortly, and we're going to do so around these three chalkboard points. First, number one, there's a clear system in place in our country that governs how we do public or common education. It's not bound by some objective truth that stands outside of the human perspective, but again, it's directed by the will of the majority or those with funding or power or influence. Chalkboard point number two, local schools are not immune from this system. Having more local control does not necessarily mean support for our conservative Christian worldview. The government has made it quite clear that in terms of everyday instruction, our faith has no place in those schools. And chalkboard point number three, it's time to get serious about training a generation of young people who know God's word, who know how to live out God's word in this current cultural moment, and then have the courage and the grace to act on what we know to be true. So the notes will be posted on the board, and now you know more. And as I say, when you know more, you can do more. 
And you can not only think differently, but you can act differently and you can say no more when you must. So today, let's get into our, our lesson. Let me uh, bring in our guest, Mr. Troy McIntosh. Thank you so much, Troy, for being here today. Troy has been a good friend for a long, long time in our Christian education circles. He came to OSIN a few years ago after having served 27 years in education as a teacher, a principal, and the last eight years at head of school at Worthington Christian School in Columbus. And again, we've worked together on many fronts and we just appreciate him and his background. He has political background even prior to this experience. He worked in the Ohio House of Representatives and the Legislative Services Commission Fellowship Program. So I know a few years ago when he was named to this post and he took this post, while on the one hand, we were very sad to see him leave our circles in the superintendency and head of school role, we were thrilled that he was the guy tabbed for this position because we knew that he would be uh, rock solid and we had full confidence that he would represent us well there and advocate for schools and, as I said earlier, religious liberty for each of us and working closely uh, with those legislators in Columbus. So, Troy, welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, so glad to join you. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> oh, man, no problem. No problem. Well, you've been in education for nearly 30 years or over 30 years, but definitely 27, as I said, working with Christian schools. You've seen a lot of changes. So let's talk big picture right now and just kind of set this up because I obviously want to go from big to small for our listeners here. In your time, philosophically, maybe even big picture, some of the major changes, because most of our listeners, I'm not sure really where they're at, but you and I, we belong firmly to that Gen X group. I'm sure we have some boomers listening, but most of our parents are now Gen Y, they're millennials, and this generation in school is Gen Z. These kids mostly were born after the year 2000, or probably all of them were born after the year 2000, so that's clearly Gen Z, and you and I both know it looks radically different now than it did when you and I were in school. So big picture, what are some of the big changes that you know people, uh, average citizen needs to know about when it comes to education? Sure. Well, certainly uh, the world today, and that includes schools, are very different than when you and I started right in the early and mid-90s. Mm. Um, and it's, it's maybe um, a bit exaggerated how different it is in reality, but the perception of schools is uh, extremely different. And I think the, the pandemic had a, a huge part in that is what COVID did was kind of peel back kind of the veil of what was actually occurring in schools and giving moms and dads a look inside the philosophy of education that dominates the public school system. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, in uh, and went to public school through 12th grade, right? So K through 12, I was a public school kid. And the public school that I went to at the time, I considered to be good. I felt like at the time I got a good education. I can look back and say I learned a lot of things uh, mm -hmm. during my K-12 education. But when I went away to a Christian college, and I began to see how my faith interacted with my education for the first time, mm -hmm. I began to look back at my public K-12 education and see where it lacked. And mm -hmm. where it lacked was it gave me no ability to make connections between my academic world and my, my faith world. Mm -hmm. So the way I thought at school was entirely different, entirely different categories than how I thought at home or at church. Mm. And that led to a very disjointed way of living. <laughs> um, and I think that has become clear to parents since the pandemic mm. um, because the, the contrast between the values that they hold, the truths that they believe in as Christians, and what their children are being taught was seen firsthand uh, for the first time. And that contrast shocked a lot of them. Mm. Right. And I think you, that's where you see this parent revolt uh, that you see so often uh, coming, uh, uh, you know, uh, across districts. And so while there have been huge changes pedagogically, technology has been a huge uh, change, generational um, things have had a huge change this has probably been the defining um, issue 
in schooling today is uh, the starkly different worldviews that are informing very different sets, very different uh, approaches to education. Yeah, well said. And you said a lot there. And I, that's exactly right. I'm glad you said that about the the disconnect that you experience. And that's a great story. I'm glad you shared your own background because we preach that a lot on stage and in Christian education to try to get uh, these families to understand that society wants us to keep that personal. It's a private opinion. It's your personal. It's fine that you have that faith, but don't bring it into the public sphere. Don't bring it into politics. Don't bring it into entertainment. Don't bring it into the media and things like that. That sounds good on the surface and even sounds good to kids on the surface. And it plays well, obviously, in public education circles, even, I think, to some Christians who are in those circles. It sounds like, you know, well, hey, we can't advocate for it. But what it does, it compounds year after year after year to exactly what you just said. You get a 17, 18, 19-year-old who says, yeah, I'm a believer, but I'm really not sure how that informs my worldview on much of anything that matters. And they go off to college and they dive into something that really matters because they get an ed, you know, a major that they care passionately about and they have no idea how to integrate this with how their, you know, their own personal faith and belief because it's always been in a box. And that has caused tremendous harm to I mean, look where we're at in this country and how the vote was just last week, right? And and the way people vote and what they watch on TV and entertainment and how they spend their time, these things are all influenced by your worldview. And if there's always been a disconnect, now you see the consequences as adults. I mean, the reality is there is no religiously neutral education, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're at a school like Mansfield Christian or whether you're at the, your local public school. Your local public school is informed by a religious worldview. Right. Um, it's just a very different religious worldview than the one that most of your uh, your community holds. Um, and so this idea of a of a neutral education being given by the public schools just doesn't exist. It's a myth. Um, right. And so, uh, you know, the idea of a Christian education is that we're going to educate our students, our children uh, in uh, according to a biblical framework, one that informs them their discipleship as young believers. I read an interesting article today that this was all about the rise of homeschooling. And apparently it was in The Washington Post recently. And they really just said, you know, from the the urban districts, you know, on the East Coast to the rural districts of the Midwest and South, the homeschooling rise is just exploding. Um, and the point of the article was we're not just going to blame this on COVID because the levels have been sustained even since COVID. Uh, they're staying with it. Uh, but the point of the article was for the first time, uh, families are grappling with this with what is actually being taught. And now they're, they're having issue with exactly what you said. They're, they're finding out that, nope, it's not neutral like we thought it was. There is a clear agenda being presented, and I have concerns about what my child is learning. So you know what? I'm going to forego some things, going to sacrifice, and we're just going to teach them at home. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. COVID, again, was just the instigation, uh, not the full cause. The cause is the uh, parents realizing there's a starkly different worldview that's being ingrained in their kids uh, in, a, in a public school setting um, and, than what they want for their children. And so parents realized during COVID that, well, maybe I can do this homeschooling. And they see it as a better way now, whether it's homeschooling, whether it's Christian school, uh, co-op, whatever it is. I think many parents are now searching for alternatives to their local public school. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, we'll come back to that. Let's uh, shift gears on. We went to Washington, D.C. together uh, with ACSI, the Association of Christian Schools uh, International there. And we were with other state representatives and some lobbying groups and things like that. But we realized how unique OSIN is, the Ohio Christian Education Network is. And as a matter of fact, other states would love to have an OSIN and they would love to have an OSIN connected to CCV. And the audience probably is like, what are you talking about here? What is CCV and what is that? Tell us about that connection. What is Center for Christian Virtue? What do they do? Where does OSIN come in? What kinds of things are you guys tackling now on behalf of educators and parents? Yeah, sure. So Center for Christian Virtue, or CCV, is Ohio's largest Christian public policy advocacy group. So mm -hmm. our offices are located right across the street from the State House, as you can see behind me. 
And we spend uh, our, our highest priority is seeking the good of our neighbor by advocating for public policy that reflects the truth of the gospel. And so we advocate on things related to religious liberty, things related to life, um, things related to uh, education, uh, religious freedom, uh, those types of things. Um, so uh, we work on uh, a lot of different bills, uh, a lot of different policy issues. About four years ago, our president, Aaron Baer, realized that um, so many of the issues that were important to Christians across the state dealt with education. And so in his kind of foresight, uh, he understood the need to start a network of Christian schools across the state. And that was really the genesis of the Ohio Christian Education Network. Um, I joined two years ago. And so the OSIN is really the education division of CCV. There is a church ambassador network and there's a Christian business partnership uh, as well. Uh, two other divisions. Um, but we are a network of 172 member schools across the state. And our purpose is to be their advocates in state government, because that is where education policy happens. 90% of it is federal government is involved on a very tiny uh, level, but nearly all education policy is done at the state level. And so we're building networks, we're relationships with lawmakers and policymakers uh, across Capitol Square. Um, so that uh, our member schools, like Mansfield Christian, can operate and flourish as their mission has called them to do. Mm, yeah, right. Uh, key initiatives right now. What are some boilerplate issues that uh, are really front and center for, for OSIN right now? Yeah, well, we just came through uh, the uh, our our big emphasis for the last 18 months, really, which was the expansion of school choice programs in Ohio. Mm. Um, and so we accomplished that with the passage of House Bill 33 this summer, which was a state budget bill that expanded Ed Choice so that now every student in Ohio is eligible for an Ed Choice scholarship of some value, right? We were advocates. We were the primary architects behind what was called the Backpack Bill, and I know a lot of your communities are familiar with that. We didn't get everything in HB 33 that we wanted. It wasn't a complete adoption of Backpack Bill, but it was about 80 to 90 percent of what we wanted. Um, and certainly we're going to continue to work to pick up those last uh, uh, few aspects of it. But school choice is a huge deal. Part of our mission is to make a high quality Christian education ge financially and geographically accessible to every student in the state. And so the Ed Choice expansion really helped us address that financial accessibility. Um, and also what we're doing is addressing the geographic accessibility. So there are essentially Christian school deserts across the state. Where now that a student, even though a student has a, a choice through the Ed Choice Scholarship, there's no Christian school alternative in their area. And so a big project that we're working on is the planting of Christian schools in areas of need, particularly targeting urban areas and low density rural areas mm -hmm. uh, for the, the startup of, of new Christian schools. So those kids who live in those areas would have uh, opportunity to go there. Right. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you addressed that because we still get it on a regular basis. You probably do, too. Uh, people will still say, so how's the backpack bill going? Or they'll refer to, you know, you got the backpack bill, right? Nope. It was different. I'm glad you addressed that. It's not the same. This is income based. But as uh, was been stated in the dispatch and others, it's estimated that 75 to 80 percent of Ohioans will qualify for the full voucher amount. So it's generous. Um, and it's going to change a little bit next year in terms of that that 20 to 25 percent that that doesn't get the full amount in terms of what amounts that they do get. But overall, pretty pleased because this hopefully will start to gain some traction, although you aren't hearing a lot about it in the media. But hopefully it'll gain some traction and it'll be a game changer for Christian schools uh, all over the state. It did not move the needle drastically like we all thought it would. And everybody thought everybody would just be rushing out now that they have these government vouchers. No, that did not happen. Didn't get passed until, what, early July or something like that. It was slow to move. Didn't get a lot of traction. But slowly people are now starting to hear about this. So HB 33, when you hear that out there, uh, as an audience, and, and that's the same as the new voucher program, and everyone qualifies for something, what as little as 10% up to 100% of whatever that cost may be. Yeah, and the other thing that we're working on is growing our scholarship granting organization, mm. which I know Mansfield Christian participates in. Um, and this, we gave through our SGO last year, $1.6 million in scholarships to students 
attending our member schools. And uh, for the 24-25 school year, our goal is to give out $5 million in scholarships. And these would be scholarships that help bridge the difference between an Ed Choice scholarship and whatever remaining tuition there is. Um, so we're excited. It takes advantage of a state tax credit that we effectively lobbied to get included in the last, in the uh, previous uh, state budget. A family can give to our SGO $750 and get a dollar for dollar state tax credit uh, mm. up to that. So essentially it's a gift that costs them nothing. Um, they can designate Mansfield Christian as the beneficiary uh, and know that their money is going directly to scholarships for kids who are attending uh, Mansfield Christian. Yeah, glad you brought that up. What a great program. And we sold it last year as best we could at Christmas programs and in, in the media and things like that. But we are so grateful uh, to the state of Ohio for, for passing that. That's just a wonderful program. And again, what uh, Troy said there was an individual can give up to 170 or uh, 700, excuse me, and $50 per person or $1,500 a couple and then get a dollar for dollar tax credit. So in other words, that's coming off your state taxes. So obviously, if you owe any state taxes above $150 or $750, then you're going to be able to make sure that that money goes to the private school of your choice. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. And as he said, we run our scholarship granting organization through OSIN, like uh, so many other Christian schools do. But you can go to their website, find out about SGOs. And it's just a tremendous way to not only obviously help out the private Christian school of your choice, but then help yourself uh, by making sure that those those tax dollars get used in a way that you would want them directed. So great, great program. Also glad that I want to go back to one thing you said, too, about uh, what you're working on right now. And you talked about desert areas, and that is uh, true because I have heard, heard that from others. Not everyone around the state of Ohio is fortunate to have a Mansfield Christian or a Worthington Christian in your backyard. And that people will drive 30, 45 minutes, you know, maybe even up to an hour, but uh, maybe a gas price is at three, four dollars. Sometimes that's that's a stretch. And plus, you have sports and activities and things like that. So people would love to have something a little closer to home. So, hey, vouchers are great. But, yeah, it's just it's just not not plausible. Um, and so one of the things that you're doing now is working with churches to say, hey, if your school would like to do something like this, then let us know. And perhaps we can help. Has that gotten off the ground yet? Have you been able to start any of those? Yeah, so we've uh, actually launched our first two uh, new schools here in Columbus. They're both urban schools. One's on the west side on the hilltop area, if you're familiar with Columbus. Um, west Side Christian uh, sits in one of the uh, poorest and most crime-ridden neighborhoods in the city. Mm. Uh, the three public elementary schools in the area, um, none of them had a third grade reading passage rate above five percent oh uh, now when you think about those numbers it hmm. it jolts you we are failing an entire generation of kids particularly in our cities um 95 percent of those kids uh are facing a future where they are not going to be able to not just be able to read they're not going to be able to to hold a job down they're not going to be able to provide for their families uh, this has generational impact and our schools aren't our, our public schools aren't solving the problem. So that 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 school actually started because I met with a pastor who who was a, a, a did, was a pastor of a church in the hilltop. Hmm. And he realized that his middle school students couldn't read the Bible. Uh, it, it was tragic. There's, how are hmm. how are we supposed to introduce the gospel to a generation of kids that's unable to read God's word? Hmm. And so uh, we believe that the church has a responsibility to step up and address the educational crisis. So last year we started Westside Christian. We had 33 students in year one. We've got 64 students this year in our second year. And then we launched Crown Preparatory Academy on the east side of Columbus. It has 17 students this year, and we're looking to grow that out in the future. And then for next school year, uh, we're looking to open three to four new uh, schools and really build this out. We want dozens and dozens of new schools uh, open across Ohio in the coming years. Mm. Yeah, great, great story. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I mean, to hear you say such thing and to put it in those words, I mean, 
I'm thinking, this sounds like a phrase I read about in, you know, what, 16th, 17th century Europe? Where we have to we have to get people to you know, learn how to read so they can actually access the scriptures, and of course we'll eventually publish it. Yeah. Good grief! How far have we? Yeah, and it's not limited to urban areas. I mean, we don't want right. to fool ourselves into thinking that because Ohio's most recent scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is also known as the Nation's Report Card, mm. uh, so these are statewide scores, showed that two thirds of our eighth graders don't read proficiently. And three quarters of them are not proficient in math. Mm. I mean, those are shocking numbers. Yeah, We're, we have a we have a major educational crisis on our hands, and we believe the church and Christian schools are the institution's best positioned to address this. Right. Even if you are philosophically opposed to giving government money to private schools, even if that's your big platform, and you're a staunch government school advocate, and you think, boy, for separation of church and state, we shouldn't do that. How are you still camping out when you hear those numbers on that side of the argument and saying, well, we don't need to at least try something different and at least maybe get them some individualized attention in another setting? I mean, just for the sheer sake of society and the betterment of all of us moving forward, you would think you'd say, you know, hard to argue with some of those things. Uh, You know, we all see it. We've got uh, manufacturing plants. We've got tech jobs. I mean, you name it. They're all coming to us as school heads going, hey, I need employees and they they need to be able to pass a drug test. They need to be able to read and write. They need to be able to do some critical thinking, things like that. And I'm not finding enough of them out there. Can your school help us? Boy, it's hard to argue with just the reality that, man, it's going to take a whole lot of educational options, good options like private schools to come alongside and say, yeah, for us to survive as a nation, a community, a state, boy, we got to let these people get into the game. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. I mean, we've had decades and decades now of an educational landscape where there was no competition, no real competition, Mm -hmm. because so many families were stuck being assigned to the district, uh, you know, according to their zip code. Right. And they did. Some families had school choice because they could afford it. But the vast majority of families couldn't. And you see what, you know, when Eastern Europe (laughs) didn't have competition in the auto industry for years and years because their communist planned government Mm. um, controlled that, you ended up with the Yugo. Right. Well, that's what we end up with right now. We have (laughs) we have a Yugo educational system that uh, is, is stunted in its growth because of the lack of competition. That's why we're excited to bring school choice options to Ohio to the degree that we have, because it's opening up the marketplace so that Christian schools and other innovative thinkers can come in and provide solutions that the, the, uh, the, the, the monopolistic system, so to speak, yeah. um, that we've had for decades weren't, wasn't providing. I know you said that, um, yes, it's the state governments that are largely responsible for education. And we know that clearly. But we also know that they're very reflective of national trends, national, you know, maybe not necessarily federal policies, but certainly national trends and educational trends that they see from coast to coast. And in education, we know that usually what happens on the coast eventually makes its way inward. And those end up becoming policies that affect affect even of us in the Midwest. Is there anything nationally that you're seeing that, wow, this is starting to, that's causing concern, starting to take root in state after state after state that is an educational issue that we should, that you know, maybe has you guys, uh, you know, your ears have perked up a little bit? Well, certainly, you know, it's no, no will be no surprise to your listeners that you see some of the uh, cultural issues that are creeping in. Uh, to our schools, and they creep in not so much through the formal curriculum of a, of our local schools. They come f- uh, in a classroom based teacher. That <laughs> teachers got a lot of freedom uh, mm. to do things in a school, and and but they have incredible influence over the minds of our kids. So while there's this stream of call it progressivism, call it wokeness, whatever. A pejorative term you want to use, it's right. real. And, and that progressive ideology is definitely growing. Now, mm-hmm. at the same time, you have this pullback um, from people that are realizing, hey, that is not what we want for our kids. And so you're seeing what I, what, what would you call clashes, right? At the school board level, you see these parents uh, having 
you know, uh, these fits of anger towards school boards where they feel the board is not listening to them. Right, right. That's why we think school choice is such a great solution and could end those school board battles. Mm. Look, if you would just give those parents the opportunity to go to another school, take their funding with them, go to another school, you wouldn't have those battles anymore. You know, and so we think school choice has such a, a, a great opportunity to address that. There are actually some federal there, there's a federal um, uh, uh, a bill right now uh, sitting in front of Congress that would create a federal tax credit for scholarship granting organizations as well. Mm -hmm. So even this, uh, you know, the, the, the momentum is definitely toward more school choice. Over the last two years, we've had eight schools significantly expand their school choice program, eight states, I'm sorry, significantly expand to almost universal uh, program. There's a battle in Texas going on right now. It's going to be interesting over the next couple of weeks to see whether they're able to be uh, the next state. But the stream is definitely moving toward more options. And to be frank, I have a hard time seeing that being pulled back very much. I think the momentum is all toward more market-based solutions more school choice for parents. Yeah. So in that sense, that's a good trend. All right. Yeah. So we're happy, you know, certainly happy about that. Well, interesting. Yeah. And I'm, I'm fascinated by those things. And and I do believe there is a connection there. And what you see nationally does make it way make its way to the states. Um, the states do have a large degree of control, but you definitely see some significant influence there as we keep an eye on each other. You've often said that um, you made the comment that boy, lawmakers are desperate to hear from their constituents, and they're often surprised. I know I was when I heard you say that that how few constituents actually it takes to move the needle at the state house. Tell us about that and your experiences. What can the average citizen do to maybe maybe uh, have more of an impact than what they think? I think most of us just think this is bigger than me. It's too much. I don't know where to begin. You know, who am I? They don't want to hear from me. But that's what you have found is not the case. Yeah. So I have a friend uh, who is in uh, the same same field as me, likes to use the phrase politics belongs to those who show up. Mm. And that's there. That is so true. Um there, I can't tell you the number of times I have had a lawmaker um, express something like this uh, when asked why he or she voted the way they did on a particular issue. Their response was because nobody told me otherwise. Hmm. So what if you spend any time down here, you realize that lawmakers deal with dozens and dozens of fields. Right. And they can't be expert. They can't be experts in each one. They may have expertise in one or two particular fields, but in others, they're largely not, not knowledgeable in. And so they rely on people, citizens, even lobbyists like me, informing them on why a particular issue is important and what ramifications it would have if it passes or if it doesn't. And so if a, a, a typical lawmaker would tell you, if they hear from just five to 10 people on a particular issue, mm. they're going to take notice. Um, and and if they don't hear from anybody, they're going to assume their vote. It's not that it's inconsequential, but that they're free to vote, you know, whatever their conscience is or whatever the caucus tells them to vote on. So the I highly encourage those listeners to participate in the process Get to know your state lawmaker, your state representative, and your state senator especially, and just get to know them by showing up at, at, the, at events that they host. I can guarantee you both of them are holding some kind of office hours or events in your community. Attend those. Talk to them. Make sure they know your name. That way, next time when you email them or call them on an issue that's important to you, they know you and there's a relationship there. That's what this is about. If they know they trust you and that you have insight, they, they largely want to be responsive to their constituency. Mm. But the constituency has to be willing to share with them uh, what they're doing. I can guarantee you somebody's out there doing it. So you might as well do it for the issues that are important to you. It could be phone calls. It could be emails. It could be letters. Um, uh, it could be a visit uh, to their office uh, in your district. Uh, that's why we find we we have an advocacy day coming up in March. Where we're going to bring 
Christian school leaders from across the state into Columbus just to meet with lawmakers for the day, just so yeah. we can start building relationships so that when an issue that's important to Christian schools comes up, we have that relationship with schools in their district and we have kind of the uh, the right to speak to that lawmaker on those issues. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm glad you said it because I think well, the key there is don't forget that if you have those thoughts or feelings that, yeah, who am I or they're not going to listen, blah, blah, blah. The other side, if they decide to get brave and however you think about it, they're going to get hurt. And they're, you know, if they decide to take action, you've just made it doubly worse by not getting involved at all. At least get your viewpoint to the table. Yeah. Um, and because, be respectful, be, respectful, be right. polite about it. But definitely they need to hear from their constituents uh, on those issues. Right. Don't assume somebody else is going to do it or they're probably already getting inundated with these things. But wow. OK, they're going to they're going to make sure that those people are heard. And if if all you want is the opposition to be heard, well, then you can continue to be silent. But it's going to come back to bite you at some point. Yeah, great. I'm glad you glad to spoke to that. Well, maybe last question. This can kind of wrap up into contact as well. But for families out there that are thinking, yeah, I kind of like what you guys are talking about. And I, you know, maybe we're in a desert area or maybe that I, I want to get more involved in Christian education movement or I want to know more about CCV and Troy and this whole idea. And I need help. You know, I've, I've heard about these issues. I don't know really where to start. Um, you know, not only how do they contact you, but what advice would you give? Would you give the average parent out there who might be looking to say, yep, I want to get on board in some way? Yeah. So uh, if you want to find out more about the Center for Christian Virtue, you can visit our website at ccv.org. Um, there you'll find all kinds of resources. You can sign up for our email uh, mailing list, and we keep um, people on the list abreast of legislation that's going on, hearings that are happening, opportunities for you to get involved. So that's the best way uh, to, to, uh, to kind of learn how to get involved. You can also visit our uh, network website at ohioceen.org. There you can find out more information about the scholarship granting organization. You can watch a, a real easy video that explain how the tax credit works. You can even make a gift there uh, if yeah. you are so inclined. Yeah, good. Excellent. Well, appreciate you again and appreciate, well, we could keep talking about this stuff all day because it's the world that you and I live in. Might have to have podcast number two to follow up some of these things, but uh, these are really good and keep up the, the good work. We so appreciate you and Aaron at uh, CCV and others that really advocate for, for all of us. And we have just really scratched the surface here today. I mean, there's many issues that we didn't uh, address and didn't talk about, but those things are, are being focused on uh, as we speak, and we're diving into those things nationally and on a state level. So I would encourage you to follow those things up, go to the website, and pursue some of these things if you've heard something that interests you. And I hope that, again, now that you know more about these things. So thank you again, Troy, for being here. We appreciate who you are and what it is that you do, and, and thanks for speaking so well to those things. Love the stories as well. Everybody likes to hear this is a great example of, of what we're talking about today. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoy it. Uh, yeah. No, I good. talking about Christian education. Yeah, exactly. It's our life. Uh, we should appreciate that. Well, thank you for joining me on Clearly Christian Podcast today. And again, I hope that now you know more about America's national education system and how that's connected to our state system and some of those issues that are pressing on the attention of America's Christian families and, of course, the local schools in our community. And again, if you'd like to help spread the word and you like what you hear, please subscribe, uh, follow along, leave a review, certainly hit the like button. I would love for you to do that. And I would appreciate that. Again, that helps us advance our cause and spread the word about Christian education. And in closing, remember, the only way that we're going to turn things around in this country is by increasing the number of people who hold a biblical worldview and live that out in their day-to-day -day lives. And the greatest hope that we have to achieve that and accomplish this mission is Christian education. So again, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening today. And we'll see you next time on Clearly Christian Education. 
Thank you for listening to the Clearly Christian Podcast with Dr. Sai Smith. Hear more episodes at clearlychristianeducation.com. If you'd like more information about Christian education in your neighborhood, or if you're interested in education opportunities at Mansfield Christian School, or if you agree with Dr. Smith and want to help him in his mission to influence and awaken Christian America, you can send Dr. Smith an email through the clearlychristianeducation.com website. Message him on the Clearly Christian LinkedIn or Facebook page, or call the Clearly Christian Connect line at 419-756-5651. This has been the Clearly Christian Podcast with Dr. Sai Smith on clearlychristianeducation.com. Brought to you in conjunction with Mansfield Christian School. A Brian Media Production.